sandwich, so I feel like I need to brush my teeth. How are you? Great. Is there a bride? Are you a bride? What are you? What are you? You're a Jewish? It's a, it's a, I don't know. I don't even, I have no idea. R2 bride too. Okay. I like it. What's that? A Jewish princess. A Jewish princess. Oh, I see. Ah, I get it. I get it. Druid princess. Okay. Okay. All right. You guys got questions? I guess I could talk. Um, um, I'm a little out of it because I'm producing a new show called 666 Park Avenue. I don't know if anybody's talking about it. We have Terry O'Quinn from Lost, many of you know from Lost, and Vanessa Williams from Everything, Everything. Everything. Lovely Betty, and Desperate Housewives, um, Rachel Taylor, and Dave Annabelle, some young actors, uh, Mercedes, Machon, Machon. Uh, Mercedes was on Chuck, for those of you that watched Chuck, she was one of the cat squad with uh, Sarah Walker. Yay! Yay, Chuck! That's the theme song for those of you that watch. Um, I'm a little sleep deprived, so I may make absolutely no sense, but I'll be entertaining, I'm sure. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm doing 666 Park Avenue. We were filming until about 2 in the morning this morning in New York, and then I got on a plane at 6 and came straight here. So that's why I'm tired. Thank you. Yeah. I was supposed to fly in last night. I don't know if any of you thought that or knew that, but I was supposed to fly in last night. No, probably not, because I would have landed at 10 or 11. But we had so many issues and emergencies, and uh, and I and, and the job that I do um, on 66 Park Avenue is kind of the the uh, the show shoots in New York City, but the writers and and all the other people are in Los Angeles, so I'm kind of the guy sent to New York to sort of run the show there. So when things are going great, it's awesome, but when things are not going well, there's nobody else around. So that's why I was there until two in the morning. It was, it was just a lot going on last night. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, check out the show, 666 Park Avenue. It's a, a very interesting kind of cross between like The Shining, um, Stanley Kubrick film, or Rosemary's Baby, or um, uh, Sixth Sense, you know, kind of ghosty and mysterious and creepy, and uh, and it's an ABC show, so there's a lot of soap opera in it as well. So, a lot of love triangles and, and ghosts. It's interesting. Uh, what else can I tell you? I don't know. I don't do that many conventions anymore, so this is fun. I've been here a long time. Can you turn the air conditioning up outside? Please, because it's really hot outside. What's that? Oh, really? You have three days. Okay. Three days to hit. That's three days. In four months, you'll hit three days that are. That's our winner. Oh, that's, that's our winner. You have a three-day winner. Okay, I'll come back to those three. That's money out there. You all live here? Everybody lives here? Yeah. yeah. Let's see what you guys got going on. Uh, basketball? Yes. Orlando Magic, right? How are they doing? They're rebuilding. They're rebuilding. Okay. <laughs> I understand. I understand. That's my aim. Bay Buccaneers. Bay Buccaneers, yeah. They're rebuilding. I'm actually, I'm a college football fan. And I'm, what's, well, I'm going to go with, I have to go with Georgia Bulldogs. That's my team. Yeah, go dogs! Uh, yeah, it's true. It's true. I know this is a dangerous room to bring up the Georgia Bulldogs connection. But uh, I'm from Georgia. You know what? If you were from Georgia, you would love the Georgia Bulldogs, but you're not. So you love the Florida whatevers they are. Neighbors and You know, that's that's how it is. What's that? 
said that? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, this is a big game. This is the toughest game for us all year. South Carolina is dangerous. Steve Spurrier, who was, uh, yeah, some, some Gators fans here. Really? How do we get to college football? I don't know. I'm delirious. All right, you guys should ask questions about Star Trek and Chuck or whatever you want, um, and then we'll talk about that. Yes, sir. This is probably one that you've covered a million times, but unfortunately I haven't heard it before. Yeah. Was Tom Paris supposed to be Nick Locarno and we didn't notice the name change, or how did that whole thing come about? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll repeat it so you guys can hear the question. He was asking about... Um, uh, was Tom Paris supposed to be Nick Locarno, the character that I played on um, Next Generation, because they were very similar. And uh, yeah, it's actually, uh, sort of, is the answer. It was, um, they really liked that episode of Next Gen with, that Will Wheaton was in and that I did with him. They liked the character, they liked this idea of a, kind of a young, uh, troublemaker, you know, someone who got in trouble, and, and in the Voyager premise of this, the ship lost, lost in the Delta Quadrant, that um, it was an opportunity for someone like Nick Carter to redeem himself. That was, the, that was the idea. But the thing about um, television shows is whoever writes an episode that created that character, Nick Carter, the, the writer of that episode, if that character comes back in another episode, or another TV series, or a movie, or anything, that original writer has to get paid. And so, honestly, I think it came down to them just going, we don't want to pay the original writer, we just want to, we'll create a new character with a new name that's pretty much exactly like that guy, and, uh, and then they don't have to pay the original writer, everything's cleaner. So that was kind of how it started, I think, uh, from what everybody told me, but, it's funny, as soon as we kind of got into the pilot in the first few episodes, at least to me it became clear that Nick Locarno and Tom Paris were very different characters. I think Nick Locarno was somebody who pretended to be a good guy to everyone around him and really wasn't a good guy. I think he was very selfish and that was Nick Locarno. I think Tom Paris pretended to be a bad guy, at least in the beginning. To you people you around. seemed very different in the first episode than you did as Yeah, you did. and yeah, I think we came into it in the pilot, and the pilot was written like Nick Locarno, and everybody kind of said, wow, we, I mean, we all agree that that's not going to work. Like, in a series, the more interesting choice is actually that he looks like a, a bad guy to everybody around him, but he's actually a good guy underneath, and that'll give us somewhere to go. And that'll give somewhere for the audience to sort of root for. You want to root for a hero who's, who's growing and changing in good ways. Usually not the guy who's a jerk and, and really is a jerk. So, so we kind of, you know, I think they, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how that happened. So, um, yeah, there were a lot of creators on, on Voyager. There was Jerry Taylor, there was Michael Killer and uh, Rick Berman, you know, so the three of them all had very different kind of perspectives on these characters, and uh, so it was interesting. Like, I know Jerry Taylor was very, very, um, very possessive of Catherine Janeway, of Captain Janeway. She really felt, and Jerry really felt like, and Jerry had grown up throughout television in a, in a time when, she's, she's retired, Jerry retired during Voyager, but Jerry Taylor came up through television in a time when it was very difficult for women. Um, in television to become writers or producers or showrunners. And so I think Jerry personally took that role of the first captain in Star Trek. Um, she took it very personally and wanted to, uh, to make that a very relatable and real character. So, so um, that was Jerry's perspective. Michael Pillar, I'm not sure. Michael Pillar was a real, really interesting man. He's passed away and um, was very talented. Michael's perspective, I think, was as a kind of a fan of, of Star Trek and a fan of filmmaking in general. He, he was a real his, uh, a film buff, knew all kinds of different movies and genres and styles. And so Michael was always playing with Star Trek and the genre. You know, he, he'd do a film noir episode. He'd love to play with that style in Star Trek. And then he'd do a, a romantic comedy kind of episode. He was very, um, he was a real, uh, kind of, you know, uh, 
student of films and film styles and things, and that was Michael's perspective, which I always thought was great about Star Trek. It wasn't always just one style. You know, week to week, you might see one episode that was very funny, and then the next week it would be very kind of creepy and scary, and the next week it would be very warm and heartfelt. So it was really fun with Star Trek to, to play with those different styles, you know. Um, anyway, yes, yes ma'am. No, I didn't direct Mentalist. I, I, uh, Roxanne Dawson, I think, directed a few Mentalists. That was also Roxanne Dawson. <laughs> we kept mistaken all the time. Uh, I have been directing a lot. Roxanne, um, I, the last few years, the last like six or seven years, I've been. Um, producing on shows, which means I, I'm not available to direct anything else, um, or, or at least not much at all. So I was producing a show called What About Brian, which was sort of a light romantic, you know, character drama on ABC about seven, six, seven years ago. I produced that show, then I produced Chuck for five years, and now I've been producing 666 Park Avenue. So while I do the, that kind of job, I'm not able to direct a lot of shows, as much as I love all, all the different shows. I did do a few shows this year as a director. I did White Collar, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Matt Bomer and Tim Decay both were on Chuck, and that's how I had a relationship with those guys. And uh, White Collar was a lot of fun. I did a, this little show called Smash, you may have heard about. Uh, the biggest publicity campaign I've ever seen in my life for, for that show, it was crazy. Um, Smash was a lot of fun because I got to go back to kind of the theater background that I had and a lot of people I knew from New York and um, so that was fun and I got to do the episode, actually Roxanne Dawson directed Smash right before me, uh, she did the third to last episode, I did the second to last episode and my episode was the one that had the very first performance in front of an audience of the show that they had been working on the whole season. So that was a lot of fun. I got to, we got to do big, you know, musical numbers and have chorus girls and, you know, all the guys and, the, you know, big stage cranes and, and, you know, 500 extras every day. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, what else did I do? Did you do Body of Proof second season? I did not do Body of Proof. Again, probably Roxanne Dawson. <laughs> I think she did Body of Proof. I, I know Roxanne has produced as well, I guess the point I was getting at, Roxanne produced on a couple of shows, but I think it was her producing jobs were not as lengthy. So she did like, I think she did Cold Case for a year or two, and I think she did, as a producer, and she did um, Crossing Jordan for a year or so, and she did something else. Like but anyway, Roxanne's had a couple shorter producing jobs, but then she's directed a lot more shows than me, probably, at this point, because I haven't, haven't done that many shows. I did V a couple of years ago. Yeah. I did the season finale of, of the first season finale of V. Um, and so that was a lot of fun. And it just happened, sometimes it would happen to fall in when I had a break on, on Chuck. But mostly I did Chuck. I probably did 20, 30 episodes of Chuck as a director. And, produced all hundred of them, or whatever we made. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what I've been doing. Yes, ma'am? Yeah. Yeah. Yay, Chuck. Yay, Chuck. Chuck. But, could you share any information, origin stories, anecdotes, anything you want to say about the adventures of Captain Proton? About <laughs> the adventures of Captain Proton. Um, I love the adventures of Captain Proton. I, I think um, the origin story of that, I, I don't know in terms of the writing of it, exactly where it came from, but my guess would be it was probably a Michael Pillar idea. Um, maybe Brandon Braga. Brandon had come in at that point. I kind of risen up at that point. I don't know, but it, it was definitely the, the, the idea was to sort of find a way to poke fun at, at the Star Trek franchise itself and have fun with it, a show within a show kind of idea. So, um, this idea of, of a holodeck program that was kind of like Flash Gordon, where we could kind of be over the top and silly and make fun of ourselves. All the things that we do in Star Trek on the show, we could sort of play you know, fun at in the, in the Captain Proton um, 
Hollander story. So, and then and then the idea, of course, of the Hollander getting um, getting uh, you know uh, attacked or whatever that we would actually have to you know, go through a mission through the program that actually the program itself was was uh, corrupted, I guess, or whatever, by a, by a real mission that we had to accomplish. So that was kind of cool that, you know, they had smart ways of integrating. I wish we could have done Captain Proton for a long, long time. I think that would have been a great one to kind of, um, and not because my character was Captain Proton, but I honestly thought that was just a great, sort of echo to what we did on our show, and the fans seemed to like it. And the writers always said they felt like the episodes were so successful that they didn't want the fans to get tired of it, or they didn't, you know, they didn't want to hurt the reputation of those episodes that had the Captain Proton by doing it too much. Which I always thought was a little, um, I thought that was a mistake, because I thought it would have been fun for the show to, to play with that as kind of a, a show within a show from, a long time, you know, not every episode, but maybe once every, you know, month or two to go back and visit it. And, um, so anyway, yeah, that's that's kind of what I know. We have one one thing about the Captain Proton. I will say, you know, when you're filming, sometimes um, people you're you're filming so many scenes throughout the day that you get sloppy and people make mistakes. And we were doing the Captain Proton scenes, and all the set decoration was very antique, you know, sci-fi, old sci-fi props and things. And we didn't notice until it had already been shot and the film was developed the next day that we had left a giant stage crane that we used for filming right in the middle of Dr. Chaotica's laboratory. And nobody noticed because it, everything in there looked kind of old. It was an old, like, movie crane. And nobody noticed. And so... They tried to cut around it, but I, I, I'm pretty sure it's still in there. There's some shots, some wide shots where you, if you look, there's like an old stage crane that we use, you know, to, to shoot scenes. Just sitting in Dr. Chaotica's laboratory. Yeah, I guess he likes to make movies too. So, it was a total mistake. Yeah. Yes, sir. Let's do this one here. Many of us know that we have to go through. Yeah, the question was, I'm just going to repeat it because some people can't hear back there, but the question was, um, you know, uh, to get an acting job, a lot of people know how hard that probably is with auditions and callbacks, but for a director, how do you get a job? Do you audition or how does that work? Um, in the beginning for me, even before Star Trek started, I had wanted to direct. Um, I had observed a lot of directors. So literally on the first day of Star Trek, I told Rick Berman when we were walking away from day one of the pilot of, of Voyager, I told Rick Berman, I said, you know, I've really been serious about learning directing, and I'd love to do it here, and I'd love to do it soon, like the first season. And he sort of laughed, and he's like, oh, yeah, maybe four or five seasons, you know. And I said, no, I really want to direct, and I'd like to do it, you know, I've been on shows that haven't gone more than a season or two, so I want to do it soon. I don't want to miss the opportunity. Anyway, so to get the first job sometimes is the hardest. And for me, the way it happened is I just kept going into screenings with Rick, the, the showrunner, um, when he was editing to, to see what he liked, what he didn't like, what, what kind of shots he thought didn't work. I'd follow different directors. I'd come in each day and kind of pretend I was directing and I would make a, you know plans for how I would shoot different scenes. And, I go sit with editor. So I did that for a little over a year on Voyager. And then Jonathan Frakes, who was supposed to direct, had to back out very last minute. And so Rick called me at home on the weekend and he said, you know, do you think you're ready to direct? And I said, yeah, I sure do. And he said, good, will you start Monday? <laughs> so, <laughs> so Jonathan had to pull out and, uh, and I took that slot and, and, you know, didn't sleep for about two and a half weeks or whatever it was filming. And, uh, uh, but it, that was uh, Sacred Ground was the episode. So that was the first one. Anyway, the first one I think is the hardest because somebody's gotta take a chance on you. Somebody's gotta say to, you know, somebody's gotta say to all of the bosses up above that I believe in this guy, and even though this guy or this girl, 
I believe in this person, and even though they have no track record, I think they're going to be able to handle your multi-million dollar episode of television. And that's a lot of risk for someone to take, so they don't, they don't do it lightly. So the first one is really the hardest, I think. Um, and as soon as I did that, I went out and made a couple short films that, went, that, that I could show other producers to say, look, someone took a chance on me to direct one episode of television, and I've made these short films in different genres. You can see how, what my skills are. And um, anyway, so that was kind of how I approached it. And, um, and then, I, I don't know, it's, it's a, a lot of it's luck and good timing. A lot of it's people you know. Luckily, I've been an actor on a lot of other TV shows before that, so I called a lot of the producers that I got along with, and I said, you know what? I am now trying to direct, and can I send you my episodes? Can I send you my short films? And I did that, and, uh, and a couple of them took chances. One was on a, a little Nickelodeon show that probably two people may know in here called The Journey of Alan Strange on Nickelodeon. Does anybody? Zero people know. Oh, uh, there's one. One, two. Exact. I, I guessed right. Journey of Alan Strange was a show on Nickelodeon about it was a fun little half hour. <laughs> I was like, whose phone is ringing? Sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, Journey of Animal Strange was one of the first jobs I did after Star Trek, and it was a Nickelodeon show, so it was relatively low budget and low, low risk. And um, it was a science, a sci-fi kind of kid show about an alien that gets left by his spaceship and has to live in the attic. He takes on the form of a young, like a 10-year-old boy and has to live in the attic of his family and, they, and the kids in the family are hiding him out. And it was a fun little comedy, you know, alien comedy for kids. Journey of Alan Strange. So, so that was a good one for me to go from Star Trek to, to Alan Strange and direct. And then the Dawson's Creek producer, uh, uh, Greg Cranes, that I had known for years, saw my stuff and he was like, I think you'd be perfect for our show, let's give it a shot. So he took a chance at me. So once you start building up some, a good reputation, that helps a lot as a director. A lot of times you're hired on reputation. If you do a, uh, an episode of television like I did in Dawson's Creek at the WB at the time, uh, they loved my first episode. They thought it was one of the best Dawson's Creeks that they had ever done. They really felt strongly about it. So all of a sudden I'm hired for six or eight more Dawson's Creek. And then I'm hired for Summerland, another WB show. And, um, I did a bunch of WB, or I did a show in Showtime called Dead Like Me because Brian Fuller, the, the, yeah, Dead Like Me was good. Brian Fuller was a Star Trek writer. Um, he was a story editor, like an entry-level writer on Voyager, but he and I had spent a lot of time talking, and uh, I thought he was very talented, and he had come to see my short films that I'd made when I screened them for uh, cast and crew. Anyway, Brian, hired me because he knew me and knew how hard I'd been trying to direct. And I did a good job on that episode, so more Dead Like Me's came along. And, you know, the network, people like you. And I don't know, it's, I guess it's like any business. You know, you're hired a lot on your resume and your reputation. Um, you don't really go in for auditions as much as a director. Uh, sometimes you go in for a meeting. When I got the job for 666 Park Avenue as kind of a executive producer, it's a pretty big job. I had to have a meeting on that, it wasn't just my reputation. And they met with a lot of directors and, um, and producers. And those kind of meetings, you go in and you kind of pitch. You tell them what you would do and how you would do it and how you like to work. And, and um, I had looked at the pilot of 66 Park Avenue and I kind of said, here's what I think are the strengths and here's how I would maintain those strengths and here's the thing I think could, we could make better. And so that, that's kind of how. That worked. That was a long explanation. But I'm tired. I'm just going to keep ranting. Yes, ma'am. What props did you get to keep? What props did I get to keep? Uh, I kept one of my space suits, one of my Tom Paris uniforms. I kept that. Um, and when I directed on Enterprise, I used to wear every Friday. Whenever it was Friday and I was directing on Enterprise, I would wear my old Star Trek uniform with tennis shoes and baseball hat because that was, I always wore a baseball hat when I directed. So that was my tradition, but I don't know if I could fit into that uniform anymore. <laughs> I'm not gonna even try, to be honest. Um, what else did I get to keep? Um, 
other props. I took the panels, you know, the plastic inset panels that were right at my station. I took a couple of those. Um, I was supposed to take my chair, the set designer, you know, the, the set people, the chair that I had, which slid on a track. It, it, it had a track so I could slide back and forth to the different buttons. And, um, and, and I, I couldn't take the chair in my car when we were wrapping up. So they said, we'll hold it for you and we'll take that little, we'll take off the, uh, the track thing so that it'll sit flat on the ground. And I said, great. And then I just, I never got it and I never got it. And like, finally it was like two years later, you know, I was doing Enterprise and I was like, do you guys still have the chair? And they're like, no, it's gone. So I really wish I had the chair. It was a cool chair. Um, what else? I don't know. Mostly it's the panels, the uniform. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I, I don't think there's anything else. Yeah, they were really, Paramount was very, um, strict as we were winding down the series because they know that the fans love collecting things and those things are valuable because people sell them or trade them or auction them or whatever. And Paramount didn't want to have the sets picked apart by crew members and cast, and you know what I mean? Um, so at, literally as we would finish a scene in sick bay, let's say, they would have a crew standing by as that scene was finished to start taking things and boxing them up to go into the Paramount Warehouse. So it was very hard to steal. I don't condone stealing, by the way. <laughs> but it was very difficult to get your hands on anything because they were put packing it away as soon as we finished. And um, yeah, it was kind of, it was a very bittersweet ending because we had such a great run. And I remember, um, Ethan Phillips, who played Neelix, was not even in the last episode. Because he, he uh, jumped off on a planet with a, a young lady uh, before we got home. And I remember, I remember he was, you know, when Ethan got that script, he was really happy to have a big story. Because we didn't always have big stories. Sometimes we'd just have a couple of lines on the bridge or whatever. So Ethan was very happy. He was like, wow, I've got this great script. But the bad news is, I'm getting off the ship and I'm not going to be in the last episode. And you know, it was, that was the first time I remember everybody going, wow, this is really over. You know, it's really ending. And that was very bittersweet. So Ethan was gone. And then slowly you work through the scenes that all the actors are in. And the last day was just Kate Mulgrew. Um, I forget who, I think she was doing some scenes with guest stars, not even the regular cast. And I remember I had gone in to say goodbye to the crew and be there, but it was very weird. It was, it was almost like a lot of the, the writers and the Paramount people had already moved on to Enterprise. Like that was already in the works. They already had sets ready to go. It was like, it was very much like, I felt like we were at a widget factory. Like, okay, we finished making these widgets, now we're gonna go make these. And it just, uh, well, they just, they just yeah, some of them got moved over and repainted. Some of them did. Right. Oh, you do? See, I told you they're valuable. How'd you get it? I can't get my hands on anything. Yeah. 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 A lot of stuff got repurposed, and uh, <laughs> they. Uh, yeah, they were. Yeah, it was it was too bad. It was it was. I, I have to say, when when Voyager first ended, I felt I was a little bitter with the way Paramount treated our cast. I felt like we had we had had a really successful show um, for seven years. I think we had really we had some great actors. We had all given a hundred percent and and made some great episodes of television. And I didn't feel like the studio really appreciated that. I think they looked at Next Generation as a cast that was the one that brought the franchise back and started making movies. And, um, and Voyager and Deep Space Nine, both of our shows, I think, were very underrated at the time, particularly by the studio. Because I think the, you know, the numbers, the audience numbers weren't as big as they wanted them to be. Or I don't know what. So, but it's interesting. I think Voyager now, looking back on it, 
really stands the test of time. I think the episodes are really strong. They're classic Star Trek kind of storytelling. I think the actors and performances were all so great. And, um, yeah, I think, I think Voyager, it's interesting, I think now for a lot of fans, and even for a lot of the actors that were in the show, like we look back on it and really, really with some distance, we can have a lot more pride and a lot more warm feelings. Because I definitely think by the time we hit year seven and we were leaving, a lot of people felt, um, you know, a little unappreciated, to say the least. So, uh, so I think it's nice now to, to have some distance. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean, is like, she asked, what, how do we feel about the young kids watching the show? That's what I mean. It's like, back then, I think there were certain expectations from the studio, and there was a lot of that kind of attention, that are we performing and everything. Now the show's out there, and there's none of that pressure anymore. So the people that come to it are coming to it just because they love it, and they, or they, they find it interesting in some way, and that's the part that I think is so cool. It's like, once you get away from that first run pressure of, Nielsen ratings and advertisers and which characters are going to get more attention than others. The show just lives on its own now and I think these young kids coming to it are seeing it from a very, uh, uh, just a really clear perspective and they're, they're, uh, they're seeing how great the show was. It really was a great show. I mean, we made a lot of great episodes. And, so, yeah. Yeah. And thanks to you guys for keeping it going. I mean, you know, Part of what I'm saying about the studio, and I should be careful because I, I don't want to badmouth Paramount. They did wonderful things for me, and, and, uh, and many of the producers did amazing things. They allowed me to direct and produce, which is something I don't I, I wanted to do. But um, but what I, what, what I was going to say is, thanks to you guys, the show survived for seven years. That the show. Uh, really achieved some really interesting storytelling because you guys stuck with it. And I don't know if Paramount would have stuck with it just if it were purely business. If it were purely just numbers, I don't know if Paramount would have stuck with the show for seven years. But I think you guys, the fans that were around during the run of our show were so passionate about it that I think Paramount, it, it gave Paramount faith, a little more faith beyond the numbers, beyond the, the Nielsen ratings the advertising dollars or, you know, gave them a little faith to look in the future and go, look, these guys really love this franchise. They love this cast of characters and these stories. We're going to stick with it. So, so thank you guys. This is applause for you. Yes, sir. What was your favorite episode? What was my favorite episode? Um, that's a tough one. I, I, I'll tell you what one of my favorite episodes, I, there was a lot of favorite episodes. One of my favorite episodes was Someone to Watch Over Me. And I happened to have directed it, but I also was acting in it and had a nice, some nice stuff to do. And I love that episode because I thought it had a great kind of, it, it explored the sci-fi kind of premise in a really interesting way, what it means to be human and, and integrating technology and the human feelings and how that all works with, with Seven of Nine and the Doctor teaching her about love, I mean, two, non-humans trying to learn about human experience. Um, and so there was that great sci-fi, kind of classic sci-fi premise, but the performances were great. I felt like what I loved about that personally for me is because I was directing, I felt like, and, I, and I, in my scenes when I was acting, I just had like a, a connection to the story in a very different way. And that was the first time where I had, I directed a, a couple episodes, I think, before that, but I hadn't had much to do. And someone to watch over me, even though I didn't have a ton to do. But I had, I had more, you know, it was, it was a decent load to carry um, with directing the episode. And, and I just felt like my acting was much freer in that episode. I felt like when I was acting, I felt much freer. And I also loved directing that episode. Um, I'm very sentimental, and there was a lot of sentimental stuff in it, so. That, that really was cool. I, yeah, I love someone to watch over me. And we got to sing a musical number. I got to go over and record um, Bob Carter singing Someone to Watch Over Me, so it was awesome. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Did you, uh, I'll repeat the question. So, 
uh, he asked, how, how was it to work with the different crew members on Voyager, and did we do practical jokes like Next Gen Cast? And yes, to that last question, there was a lot of, uh, yes, there was a lot of practical jokes. I've told this story before. Well, first of all, there were fart wars between a few of us that went, you know, above and beyond anything humans should even be capable of. I mean, the, the fuel that we loaded up with was, it was just childish. And the fart wars were led by Tim Russ, exactly. <laughs> You're right. He was vicious and he was heartless and just, and he would load up with things that people shouldn't be consuming for no other purpose than to just let her rip later on. He knew what he needed to do to get there. It was unbelievable. Yeah, Tim Russ, Ethan Phillips, and myself. All right, that, that was the... That was the triangle of death, some people would say. Um, yes, there were a lot of practical jokes that had to do with farting. Um, there was one where I had had a cold one day, and um, and everybody, and no, and Kate Mulgrew really had been saying, like, stay away from me, I don't want to get sick, don't touch me, don't breathe on me, you've got a cold, I don't want to get sick. And so we had a briefing room scene with everybody, you know, the whole cast in the briefing room. And I was in the makeup trailer, and I noticed on the, you know, they put the prosthetics makeup on people, and they use glue, this clear rubber glue. And I saw in the little jar at the makeup artist station, the glue had sort of spilled over the edges and sort of dried, and it looked like snot. It sort of dried, like, but it looked like a ton of just, in my mind, of course, because I'm a child, that's what I thought of. So I'm like, this is awesome. Kate is completely freaked out that I'm gonna get her sick. So I'm gonna take this, so I peeled it off, and I stuck it all up on my nose like this. And then I put some like Vaseline or something. I, you know, I made it look really fresh. And then I was like, I told the ADs, I said, wait till everybody's in the briefing room, I wanna come in last. And so they said, okay, everybody's in there, Kate's in there, so I'm like, great. So I go in and I've got these like, just nasty like, looking snot just rolling down. And I go up, I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry, Kate. <laughs> and I sneezed, and I like had my hands out. I'm like, oh god, it's just. And she was just, she freaked out. I mean, I thought she was going to climb the walls, and, and, and it was just priceless. It was just priceless. Um, that was pretty good. We also had practical jokes, like, you know, there were a lot of times where we'd have group scenes, like on the bridge or the briefing room, and. You know, like Robert Beltran, Chakotay, and myself, and maybe Tuvok, we wouldn't have much to say. You know, the captain would blah, 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 blah. And we'd go, yes, ma'am, or whatever, you know, or whatever. We'd have like a little line here or there. So we got very bored, to be quite honest. So we would entertain ourselves with like the stupidest thing. It was just the stupidest thing. It's like one, one time, Robert Beltran and myself, and I think it was Tim, we had coffee cups. And we would like, we were playing a game of like, who would sip the coffee cup when, and it was, it was really stupid. Like there was not even logic to why it was funny, but we would just look at each other between the lines and like try to sip the coffee a different way or sniff the coffee as we were thinking. It was just like, it became like the whole scene. I didn't even know what cap the captain said. Because all I was doing was looking at what were they doing with their coffee cup. Low on it. You know, it was like, it was just, and we tried to do the, whatever we could to make each other laugh. Especially if we knew we were off camera. You know, if I was off camera and Robert Beltran was on camera, well then it was great. I could, I could take that coffee cup and do all kinds of horrible, indecent <laughs> things. So, um, you get the idea of stuff like that. Um, what was it well, like working with everybody? Kate Mulgrew was a passionate, professional, diva, uh, you name it. I mean, she was all those things in a great way. Um, she was very passionate about the work and about the show and about her role as the first female captain. And, and early on, she did a lot of um, traveling, kind of representing the franchise and the first female captain at big events, you know. Um, a lot of things, you know, fundraisers for women politically. She went to, the, I think, the White House for something with Hillary, Hillary Clinton back in the Clinton White House. She, I mean, she was 
that was a big deal. You know, now we kind of just take it for granted. Oh yeah, Kate Mulgrew was one of the captains and Avery. And, but back then that was like, is this gonna work? Are people gonna accept it? And Kate felt the pressure of that. So she took it very seriously. Um, who else? Robert Beltran. Oh, Robert, Robert, Robert. <laughs> Robert was just, Robert was like, uh, he, he was just a character. It was like, I don't think he believed that he was re really ever on the show. Like, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think he ever thought it was real. It was really happening or, I don't know. He would, uh, he was the first one to invent the, the technique of taping his lines to the console. So he would be, you know, sitting there and looking at the console with Captain and I and see it. And it was, he was reading it the whole time. And, and I had sat down front for the first two years with everybody behind me on the bridge for all those scenes. And I had remembered all that technobabble. I had remember, I'd memorized the scenes. And then one day, like in two years into filming the show, I go back there and I see Robert has his lines taped to the thing. And I go to Garrett, and Garrett's got pages <laughs> taped out on his thing. And I've never seen it because I was down front, like way back there, right? So even if I look back, I don't see it. And I was like, mother. <laughs> Princess. 
Definitely towards the beginning. Definitely. Yeah, I, I would say by the time you're two years into a show, it's already figured out everything that that is that is a mystery about it. And you're kind of then just repeating all those lessons you've learned. But the first year, and particularly the first the first ten or twelve episodes or eight or ten, the first few episodes are impossible because you know, pilots Pilots are always set up. A pilot is a great idea to set up a series, but the series is a whole different thing. A pilot's kind of easy. You can say, you know, what if these guys got hired, you know, this, this odd couple got hired at the same job and they have to work together. And so the pilot of that is basically, these guys hate each other and at the end of it, their boss says, you two have to work together. And then you go to two series. Well, the series part is the hard part. It's like, how do you make it different? You can't keep doing that story, the pilot story every week. So the, the beginning is hard, and the beginning is exciting because you're figuring it out. Um, on Supernatural, I came in, and I don't remember the number of my episode. I want to say it was like five or six, something like that. Uh, it was the first season of Supernatural. But the pilot had been really evocative. It, it was a scary... Um, cool, um, you know, fresh feeling kind of um, uh, horror show, you know, uh, kind of X-Files even not, but hipper and cooler. But they didn't know what the show was going to be. They knew they wanted to have some, some light comedy between the guys. They had figured that out by the time I got there, because they'd seen those guys interact in life, but they hadn't found it in the show. And they wanted some real scary, not just creepy. Up until that point, they had a lot of creepy. The pilot was scary, but then a lot of creepy. Anyway, I think um, what was really exciting about the episode I did called Skin was that I think they felt like they finally found that balance. We found a way, you know, we found a way in the episode to have the relationship be very interesting and fun, and you liked these guys, and you laughed with them because they teased each other, and that was not something that had really happened. So the script helped us get there, and we got there in, in, in kind of the direction of the, of the show. And then the other thing was making it scary. And we had this episode where the shapeshifter is taking over bodies, and you see it at one point kind of shed its skin, and you even have this, it takes over one of the brothers, and they have to fight each other, and, uh, or it takes on the form of the brother, and they have to fight each other. So uh, there was some scary stuff in there, like this shedding of the skin was just horrific, you know, creepy you know, turn your head kind of scary. So it was really fun. So anyway, at the end of that, um, I think they moved that episode up. I think they liked that episode so much, it was like maybe five or six in the order, but they moved it up a couple uh, to air it earlier because they thought it was very, very, um, very much on target. So that's always exciting when you feel like, wow, we finally found a way to make the show in seven or eight days, whatever the, the, sh the budget allows. Um, and, and, and hit the creative targets that everybody wants and make it on time and on budget. Um, so that was really fun, you know. It was very exciting. The first two shows are always fun. They're hard, because you, you don't know what the show is, you know. It's kind of like when I went to White Collar this year. It was season four of White Collar. Um, but it definitely, it felt like, I, I had fun, but it felt like season four of a show. Like, everybody kind of knew it. The crew didn't need me to tell them exactly how to set shots because they know what the look of their show is. The actors didn't need me to tell them about their characters. They knew more than me um, about their characters. You know what I mean? So that's, it's fun. It's fun to try something different, but it doesn't have that same sort of, like you're walking a tightrope in the way that you do with a first year show. At 666 right now, we're still, you know, we're, we're into it and we're still, trying to figure out what the perfect balance is and how we do that in our budgeted time, which we haven't done very well so far. <laughs> uh, yes, sir, way in the back. Anything I'd go back and revisit? Uh, yeah, yeah, all, all the time. Probably
probably every single episode I've ever directed, I would go back and revisit and change something about it. Um, yeah. I, I mean, if there was a big one that I think I could go back and redo the whole experience, I would say I did a show called Everwood for the WB, and I did a first season episode, early show, early number, and I would like to redo that episode. I think it was, that was very early, that was only the second year after Voyager went off the air, and I just started directing a lot that year. And it was an early episode of Everwood, which was very, a big opportunity for me, having only directed, you know, a couple of things at that point. And I don't think I handled some of the actors well. And there were some actors that were a real challenge. And if I had those same actors today on an episode of television, I would respond to them very differently than I did back then. But I felt like I kind of let them roll over me. And I let them behave in ways that were not helpful to the episode, and certainly weren't respectful to me. But I felt like I was so new to, to directing that I didn't know how to exactly express myself the way I would now. I know how to express myself very well now, so <laughs> I would say some things to them. Yes, sir. Yes, okay, one last question, and now there's such pressure. I'm gonna go right over here with my favorite new fan. Yes, you, right there, Devin. Was it, what, a little bit louder, the quantum leap exit? Yeah, Devin just asked, he, he just um, got into Voyager recently, right? And uh, I met him today, yay! And uh, he just told me in line over here uh, when we're talking about autographs and things. He said he had seen an episode of Quantum Leap that I did um, a long time ago. And how was that? Um, it was great. It was it was especially great because um, Scott Bakula, who I didn't know at the time, um, was the first time I worked with him. And now I've worked with Scott a few other times. But that was the first time. And he impressed me so much, Scott Bakula, by the way he treated the crew. He, he, was, he knew everybody's name. He, he looked them in the eye and thanked them at the end of the day. He was incredibly respectful of how hard everybody worked, not just the actors. I'd never seen uh, an actor do behave that way to everybody, the crew and the cast and everybody. So he was great. Um, and I also, um, I also just loved doing the period, you know, there was a period, Quantum Leap obviously was about time travel and all that, and it was just fun. You didn't often get to do something that was not contemporary, everyday stuff in television, and that was a little different, so that was fun. Um, I did a couple shows in period stuff. I did a show called Homefront, um, back in the, yay, Homefront. Homefront was uh, set in, like, during World War II, right after World War II, and that was a series that ran a couple years, and, uh, and was a lot of fun. But Quantum Leap was great, particularly because of Scott, particularly because of Scott Bakula. And, you know, it's interesting how those things work, because I met Scott and was so impressed by him. Worked with him again on Enterprise um, as a director when I directed the first three seasons of Enterprise. And then, cut to a few years later, I'm, I'm producing Chuck, and we're talking about actors who might be good actors to play Zach Levi's father, Chuck's father in the series. And we went down a list and Scott's name came up and I was like, that's the guy. That's exactly who it should be because I've worked with him and he's the kind of guy that would fit our show perfectly. And uh, not, just, not just how he acts, but who he is, you know, to be on the set with and spend time with. And so, and, and Scott loved him and Chuck. And so, um, it's funny how small the world is sometimes, and little things like Quantum Leap lead to Scott, you know, getting to do Chuck and work with us. So, anyway, thank you for that question. Thanks, guys. Really good to you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert.